According to the Oryx blog, as of February 1st, 2024, Russia has lost 2,678 tanks during its invasion of Ukraine. Of these, 1,753 have been destroyed, making for a destruction rate of 65.4%. The total tank losses account for 21.4% of Russia's pre-war tank fleet of about 12,500 units. To make matters worse for the Kremlin, the Oryx numbers account for only the visually confirmed losses. The true number of Russian tank casualties is likely higher, in everything from the stalled convoys outside of Kyiv at the start of the war to the frequent jack-in-the-box explosions of Russian tank turrets, Putin's depleted tank force has become a meme. This meme has reinforced the opinion of some war watchers that the tank has become obsolete on the modern battlefield as a result of improved man-portable anti-tank weapons like the Enlor and Javelin, the rise of precision-guided artillery, and perhaps most importantly, the ascendancy of drones to being one of the centerpieces of warfare. However, the death of the tank is an overstated idea. Tanks remain useful in many important battlefield functions. Russia is just using its tanks improperly. In this video, we will look at how Russia has mismanaged its armored forces and the deep doctrinal origins of the tank tactics that have proven so ruinous on the battlefields of Ukraine. It is true that Russian tanks suffer from serious design flaws. The most common tank in the Russian fleet, the T-72, has some admirable qualities despite these flaws. It's cheap and easy to produce with a powerful 125mm smoothbore gun. However, this tank was not designed to fight in wars of the type Ukraine has evolved into. Also, the tank's ammunition is not sealed away from the crew compartment. Instead, the ammunition is stored under the crew and loaded by the T-72's autoloader. As modern man-portable anti-tank weapons target the thinly armored turret of an enemy tank and kamikaze drones can easily dive down on such turrets as well, the results have often been a chain reaction that destroys the entire ammunition magazine leading to the jack-in-the-box explosions that totaled the tank and its crew. The T-80 and T-90, which are ultimately based on the T-72, suffer from the same structural vulnerabilities. However, this weakness alone does not explain why Russia has lost so many tanks in Ukraine. It's also true that the Russians have simply failed to adequately support their armored units. Namely, the Russians do not have a cohesive combined arms approach to warfare. A United States Army manual from 2012 called ADRP-30 Unified Land Operations has a good definition of the combined arms doctrine. Combined arms is the synchronized and simultaneous application of arms to achieve an effect greater than if each arm was used separately or sequentially. Combined arms integrates leadership, information, and each of the warfighting functions and their supporting systems. Used destructively, combined arms integrates different capabilities so that counteracting one makes the enemy vulnerable to another. Used constructively, combined arms multiplies the effectiveness and efficiency of army capabilities used in stability or defense support of civil authorities. Combined arms uses the capabilities of each warfighting function and information in complementary and reinforcing capabilities. Complementary capabilities protect the weaknesses of one system or organization with the capabilities of a different warfighting function. For example, commanders use artillery fires to suppress an enemy bunker complex, pinning down an infantry unit, movement and maneuver. The infantry unit then closes with and destroys the enemy. In this example, the fires warfighting function complements the movement and maneuver warfighting function. Although the combined arms doctrine might sound modern, it has its origins in ancient warfare. One of the more famous examples would be the Macedonian army under Philip II and his son, Alexander the Great. Like the Greeks centuries before them, these two Macedonian monarchs used the phalanx infantry formation as their army's main arm, but combined it with missile units, light infantry, and heavy cavalry. Archers and slingers would disrupt enemy formations, the phalanx would move into position to hold them in place, and heavy cavalry would deliver a smashing hammer blow from the flanks or rear with the light infantry acting as reserve units that could be rapidly deployed as needed. In more modern times, it took a combined arms approach of well-used artillery for fire support, infantry for maneuver, and tanks for forward momentum, together under cover of air support to break the deadlock of trench warfare in World War I. Prior to this, these arms were often used separately or improperly or inadequately supported, leading to four bloody years of the trenches. For the United States, the lessons of combined arms warfare were reinforced during Operation Iraqi Freedom and the bitter counterinsurgency campaign that followed. Tanks proved vulnerable if they were unsupported, especially in the urban settings where the fighting concentrated. 
proper infantry support was needed to maneuver toward hidden nests of enemy resistance, especially in the presence of civilians, which dictated a need for the type of accurate armored or fire support that only infantry could determine in order to prevent non-combatant casualties. Russia, on the other hand, has a doctrine that shies away from a combined arms approach to warfare, and instead heavily emphasizes artillery and tanks. The origin of this approach comes with the Soviet Union's Deep Battle Doctrine, which was first developed in the 1920s and 30s. The Deep Battle idea was the Soviet Union's attempt to create a middle ground between the tactical and strategic levels of warfare, the operational art, in other words. Deep Battle had one overarching objective, to keep things moving on the battlefield. At all costs, the Soviet brass wanted to avoid a repetition of the trench drudgery seen in World War I. The Soviets therefore envisioned waves of tanks smashing through narrow and vulnerable portions of the enemy front line. Wave upon wave of tanks and then infantry, supported by artillery, would pour in on the same axis and be ready to deploy in repeat operations. Stalin's purges of most of the Soviet military's best officers in the 1930s meant that the doctrine saw delays in implementation, but when it did get employed, it proved highly successful. The Nazi war machine was never able to develop a true answer for it. The Red Army bore the vast majority of the brunt of the fighting against the Nazis on land during the Second World War, and its success against Hitler solidified the notion of deep battle into Soviet and later Russian military thinking. However, there was a big flaw to deep battle. It was costly, inflicting enormous casualties on friend and foe alike. In fact, the Soviet Union suffered far more casualties than Nazi Germany did in the conflict, and although much of this was due to the Nazis striking at a time of high Russian vulnerability in 1941 and 42, not all of it was. Even in 1944, the Soviet Union suffered battlefield losses of 5 million to Nazi Germany's 1.1 million, according to Colonel Trevor N. Dupoy in his Numbers, Predictions and War. The Soviet Union could afford to take such lopsided casualties because of its overwhelming advantage in numbers and material, and because its Western allies gradually destroyed German industry through air raids, but the Red Army's wartime performance revealed a serious flaw in the Deep Battle Doctrine. Unless you broke through quickly, you were simply sending more and more units into the deeply entrenched defensive positions, which was, in effect, asking for a repeat of the Soviet Union's miserable experience in the Winter War against Finland between 1939 and 1940. Operation Mars in 1942 showed what could happen if deep battle failed. Often called Zhukov's greatest defeat, this attack centered on the town of Rzhev against experienced German troops entrenched in well-defended positions with adequate panzer support. The Soviet Union lost about 200,000 men and perhaps two-thirds of the tanks it employed in the battle in exchange for 40,000 German casualties. The Soviets failed to dislodge the German defenders from their fortified positions. Operation Mars is little known today. Perhaps if the Kremlin remembered its lessons more, it could have avoided taking such heavy armored losses in the current war. In Ukraine, the Russians have fought with something that resembles deep battle doctrine, with similar tactics and consequences should things go wrong for the Russian armed forces. In the war's first year, Moscow preferred to use its artillery in World War II-style saturation fire. However, a shortage of ammunition has since forced the Russian army to be more selective in its target selection and fires. The use of artillery was not the only thing that resembled World War II-style employment of military force. The Deep Battle Doctrine still haunts Russia in the way it's deployed its tanks as well. Often these armored units were and are deployed without proper infantry support. The most famous example came in the Battle of Kyiv at the start of the war, where unsupported Russian tanks proved easy pickings for the elite Ukrainian infantry units armed with javelins and N-laws. Drones have also had their way with these units. In the Battle of Kyiv, stalled tank convoys were vulnerable to high-flying Turkish Bayraktar TB2 drones armed with air-to-surface missiles. Later, even cheaper first-person view FPV drones armed with anti-tank grenades inflicted high casualties on unsupported tank units. In Ukraine, Russian units have often moved into heavily fortified areas without support from other types of arms. Wave upon wave of Russian tanks tried dislodging entrenched Ukrainian defenders armed with tank-killing weapons to predictable results. After the failure in Kyiv, Russian units managed to grind their way forward in Ukraine's Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts in the summer of 2022, but their tactics changed little. To make matters worse for Russia, much of the fighting in Ukraine has involved urban battlefields, which make unsupported tanks particularly vulnerable to ambushes. 
Russia under Putin in fact had experience on such urban battlefields during the Chechen Wars of the 1990s and early 2000s, where Russian T-72 and T-80 tanks were often decimated by Chechen rebels armed with man-portable anti-tank weapons like RPGs. The Russian armored casualties were so great that Moscow was hesitant to deploy its supposedly latest and greatest tank, the T-90, into that conflict. Similarly, the Kremlin has refused to deploy the T-14 Armata onto the battlefields of Ukraine for fear of losing the few such tanks that it has, even though the Armata should theoretically do better because it's better protected from the jack-in-the-box explosions seen so often in its earlier tank types. Unlike the United States and its allies, who absorbed the lessons of urban combat in Iraq, Russia seemed to learn nothing from its miserable experience in Chechnya and made no modifications to its military doctrine before the start of the invasion of Ukraine. Again, tanks move forward without proper infantry support into urban environments. In such a setting, Russia has been left with little choice but to resort to the same tactics it used in the Chechen Wars, most notably seen at Grozny. Reduce these population centers to rubble with all the defenders inside, heedless of civilian casualties. There is another problem with Russia's deep battle doctrine. Much of it is based on the massed tank versus tank battles for which the T-72 and its successors, the T-80 and T-90, were designed. But classical tank battles have proven rare in Ukraine. Instead, tank combat is far more based on a first-look, first-kill dynamic. Drones or other assets spot tanks from far away. From there, the tank's coordinates are sent to artillery crews or kamikaze drones are unleashed on them. The tanks are then destroyed long before they get into range to engage in combat with enemy tank formations. Soviet and Russian deep battle doctrine envisioned mass tank engagements and military engineers designed the T-72 for this purpose. Because the T-72 was cheap, it could easily replace its losses. As we've pointed out, deep battle doctrine emphasized continuous operations that would not stop after the first breakthrough. Deep battle called for consecutive operations to fully penetrate and destroy an enemy army. Gone were the days where one could effectively destroy an enemy's army in a single engagement such as that seen in the Battle of Guagamala under Alexander the Great. Because modern armies had hundreds of thousands or millions of men over thousands of miles of front, successive engagements would be needed to destroy their ability to present effective armed resistance. The Russian T-72 was made to deploy with such a doctrine in mind. However, warfare has gotten smaller in some ways since the days of the Second World War. In Ukraine, engagements have been fought not at the level of the core or division, that the deep battle doctrine envisioned and for which the T-72 tank and its offshoots were designed. Instead, engagements have usually come on the much smaller scale of the company or platoon level. Such small-scale engagements have meant that Russian tanks are fighting a type of war they were not designed to fight without the numbers they need to turn the tide against well-armed Ukrainian resistance. The lack of proper air support has been another major vulnerability in the way Russia has deployed its tanks. In a theme echoing its treatment of the T-14, Russia has famously refused to deploy its supposed best fighter jet, the fifth-generation Su-57 Felon, over the skies of Ukraine. Russia has also not used its air force in a systematic way since the start of the invasion. It has not established air superiority or provided the type of close air support that the combined arms doctrine would call for, especially during the first year of the war. The modern air defense systems the Ukrainians have put in place to guard their most heavily fortified positions have made the Kremlin leery about using its air force in an offensive capacity. Russia was keener to deploy its air units, especially its helicopters, in the Zaporizhia campaign of 2023. But this was when Russia was on the defensive and its air fleet was not under as heavy a threat as it would be if it were attacking fixed Ukrainian positions in offensive operations. Aside from the doctrinal problems Russia has encountered with the use of its tanks, there are also practical reasons for Russia's inability to properly support its tanks with infantry. Russia is in a demographic decline. Unlike in the days of the Soviet Union, it no longer has an overwhelming manpower advantage compared to its enemies. Although Russia outnumbers Ukraine, the latter is in a far better position than Nazi Germany was, or even NATO was, in the Cold War. Nazi Germany's population in 1938 was about 70 million people, with about 12 million men in military service by 1944. The Soviet Union, on the other hand, had 195 million people, with 52.3 million men between the ages of 16 and 59. The Red Army had about 34 million men in service starting in 1941, 
giving the Soviet Union a manpower advantage of nearly 3 to 1 at a time when Nazi Germany's ranks were at their high point in 1944. Through much of the war, the manpower advantage was closer to 4 to 1 in the Soviets' favor. These numbers allowed for the deep battle doctrine to work during the Second World War, despite all its flaws. Today, Russia's population is about 147 million, to Ukraine's population of about 33.2 million. The estimated military personnel between the two countries as of 2023 is 1.33 million to 500,000, giving Russia a manpower advantage of 2.6 to 1. In practice, the number will be less than that because Russia cannot deploy all of its armed forces to Ukraine. It needs some troops to guard its vast land borders in the Far East and elsewhere. The lack of overwhelming manpower advantage has meant that Russia's traditional style of fighting hasn't served it as well in Ukraine as it did during the Second World War. Namely, the lack of manpower advantage meant that Russia had comparatively little infantry on hand to protect its tanks, particularly during the early months of the war. The disadvantage was most pronounced in urban terrain. There, Ukrainian troops armed with advanced Western weapons like the Javelin could lay easy ambushes and destroy Russia's armored columns. The technological edge allowed for Ukraine to make up for being outnumbered, and Russia did not outnumber Ukraine by enough to compensate. Russian logistics have also proven inadequate to support the type of warfare that its traditional military doctrine calls for. Out of visually confirmed cases, 1,282 Russian tanks have been lost due to capture or abandonment. To keep tanks moving, it's necessary to keep them fueled and repaired, as they will inevitably break down under battlefield conditions. It's also necessary to have armored recovery vehicles to assist them, should they malfunction or get bogged down in mud. Russia has lacked in all of these areas, which has prevented its armored columns from maintaining the momentum needed to keep an offensive going on the type of broad scale that its traditional military doctrine calls for. Meanwhile, from the start of the war, the Ukrainian military has used its tanks in a way much more similar to how they were successfully employed to break the stalemate of trench warfare in 1918. Although traditional close air support has been lacking, Ukraine has used its armor in conjunction with infantry and artillery, absorbing important lessons from the Western military training it got before and during the war. Ukraine has also, until recently, proven superior in deploying its drones to spot targets of opportunity and then exploit openings with infantry and armored forces working in concert. In short, tanks are not obsolete. Ukraine demonstrated this fact when it used its armored forces to help regain thousands of square kilometers of territory in the summer and fall of 2022. Although much less successful in 2023, Ukraine's Western tanks, such as the German Leopard, helped its armed forces to break through the first two of Russia's defensive lines in the Zaporizhia Oblast, which are the most sophisticated fortifications built in Europe since World War I. Ukraine proved unable to translate these achievements into wider breakthroughs, but it did show the continued usefulness of tanks in tasks such as storming fortified positions. The usefulness of tanks is now, as always, dependent on how they are deployed on the battlefield. Since ancient times, astute generals have understood that one type of arm is vulnerable if it's not supported by other arms. Infantry can be slow to move. Cavalry or armor is vulnerable if the momentum is halted. Artillery is practically defenseless without other units to protect it. Air support is vulnerable if there are no ground forces to protect it from anti-air fire and so on. Russia's bitter experiences in Chechnya should have proven this point to the Kremlin's military brass. However, the ghost of the Red Army and its learning some of the wrong lessons from World War II still seems to haunt Russia's military today. If Russia has adapted in some ways since the disasters of 2022, it has done so because it learned them the hard way, through terrible losses on the battlefield. And if the recent fighting around Avdivka is anything to go by, Russia is still very much enthralled to the ideas that have caused it to use its tanks improperly in offensive operations. But what do you think? about Russia's tank doctrine and how it's deployed its armored forces in Ukraine. Is there anything it can do to improve its situation and reduce its armored casualties? Don't forget to let us know in the comments. Also, make sure to hit the like and subscribe buttons to support the channel and to get more military analysis from military experts.